Good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Professor Lonnie Shea today. Um, Dr. Shea works more on the squishy side of neural interfacing like I do. Um, he has several research interests, um, including anywhere from regenerative medicine through neural tissue engineering. Um, most of you, or a lot of you probably saw us talk yesterday. Um, and my, the reason I brought him in, because I've been following his work for, for years in the spinal cord area in, in neural engineering. Uh, when I went to print his CV to, to give a summary last night, we, the copy ran out of paper because of how accomplished he is. Um, so just some of the highlights. Um, after leaving Case with his bachelor's and, and master's degree in chemical engineering, um, he took a position um, as a postdoc at University of Michigan. And then in 1999, began, um, began as a, an assistant professor at Northwestern. And he was there until about two months ago when he started as a chair of biomedical engineering back at Michigan. In that time, he's managed to find time to write 184 papers, including um, an additional eight book chapters and almost two dozen patents, and 69 funded grants. So that's just, re I can't even fathom that. Um, including, um, in my count, um, which I lost count going through the, the long pages of the CV, at least nine R01s. So um, very impressive, and it's, a, it's an honor to have him here to talk today. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. After uh, 22 years away, it's uh, really been a, a great homecoming. And fortunate you guys arranged the snow for me to really feel like at home back when I was having to trudge up and down the hills and everything. So I'm very grateful for that. And um, I didn't have the, the fortune of really knowing the neural engineering group while I was here. And so it's great to be able to come back and kind of uh, learn that. It definitely was something that is an area that I got into through some opportunities as uh, my career was beginning at Northwestern, some contacts that I made through the Christopher and Dana Reeve uh, Foundation. And we've been able to run. So I want to just kind of share with you uh, some of those uh, approaches. But just to begin with, just kind of the philosophy that we, we've taken. I've often referred to my lab as doing systems tissue engineering. And uh, the systems has a, a, a twofold meaning. Uh, and one fold of the idea is that you know, problems such as spinal cord injury are highly complex. And there's not sort of a magic bullet that can suddenly going to make everything better. And so the idea is we want to really work towards the idea of systems to really be able to complex the, to address the complexity that's present within the spinal cord in order to really allow for the regeneration to occur. And so the systems come using uh, biomaterials as, as kind of a foundation where we can modulate cell adhesion, potentially cell-cell contacts, as well as you know, tune the mechanical properties um, for some applications. And then also bringing in uh, drug delivery, gene delivery, um, have been uh, hallmarks of what we've been doing over the years. And I'll be talking particularly about the gene delivery um, today in terms of things we've been doing. And then most recently, nanoparticles has started to come into our area as essentially just yet another tool. And I was talking with Jeff at dinner last night who asked me to add a couple slides on something. So I thought I would uh, try to cover that as well. Um, just so you kind of get a picture of the lab as a whole that uh, I spoke yesterday in our work on terms of islet transplantation for diabetes and um, using some of the similar approaches for that, as well as uh, work towards actually the early detection of metastatic cancer as well. Um, I'll be, we've also had a range of work that we've been working on over the years in terms of uh, culturing ovarian follicles as a way of preserving fertility for women facing a cancer diagnosis and, and the transplantation of those follicles as well. But uh, obviously today I'm going to be focusing on the uh, spinal cord injury and, and that model. So I don't, just to give the right context, and I won't go into great detail, detail on this because I'm sure Many of you could probably say this much more effectively than I could. But obviously, there is initial injury um, that can happen to the spinal cord, compromises the blood-brain barrier, leads to the infiltration of um, blood and immune cells into the area. Essentially, there is um, injury. Um, myelin debris gets created. Um, neurons begin. Um, the axons become severed. There's a dieback. And essentially, you end up starting to create a gap um, that you need to, to solve and to regenerate. But then kind of a, a significant component of this is that as the um, blood comes in, you begin to gain this um, enhancement in neuroinflammation that sort of exacerbates the initial injury, leading to um, things such as this uh, glial scar that can develop around the outside, 
which ultimately becomes a barrier to regeneration. So clearly there are, it's a complex milieu, it's a really complicated problem, and we've, uh, and there's been a lot of approaches out there from cell transplantation, drug delivery and everything, and I'd say that uh, just to kind of give you the perspective of where we've come is we haven't really attempted to do much with functional recovery in the sense of, you know, can our animals walk better or things like that. That's something we started to do as late, and I will show that data. A large part of what we focused on is how do we get axons to cross this? What can we do? And so most of what I'm going to show you is really histology based. What have we done? And because, you know, the, the complicating factor, as you, many of you will know, is that it's possible to actually have spared axons that essentially grow around it or the plastic, plasticity, where our focus has really been, can we get an axon to grow through an injury site in some way? And this, our approach is really motivated by the, the pioneering studies that I'm sure many of you have heard about in terms of uh, back in, you know, around 1980, the David and Aguayo papers where they essentially had done a transection to the spinal cord and they implant a sciatic nerve graft and they actually able to see axons grow through this graft. And that was really one of the, um, essentially, obviously changed the perception in terms of the ability of the spinal cord to regenerate. And so we said, how can we recreate something like this without using a peripheral nerve graft to try to identify, well, what are the key components of, of what's happening? And so there are uh, a couple things that we've sort of focused on in terms of a material in our design. Uh, this is the time where I'll actually introduce my collaborators of Eileen Anderson and Brian Cummings who are at UC Irvine. Um, Eileen in particular has worked in the area of neuroinflammation for a long time, um, has also been the person running the Christopher Reeve uh, core that would also often, uh, people would do different interventions and they would get some great result and then they would send it to her as a way of validating what they had done. So she would be running lots of techniques in terms of that. And uh, Brian has also uh, been essentially working with, with um, Eileen as well and at the same time has really brought a lot of stem cell expertise into as well. And so together they've been working in neuroinflammation and stem cells um, for their strategies and were um, you know, going forward, I'm going to present to you all the work we've done with sort of the materials and the drug delivery. And going forward, we're going to really bring those two technologies together in terms of stem cells and our materials. And uh, I'm hoping it's going to be an exciting future for us. But uh, so, well, that's enough about them. So our idea was we're going to have a synthetic system that can promote axon growth through the injury. And so we've really got to think about, okay, how do we prevent the inflammation? How do we recruit the right cell types? give it some sort of physical guidance so the axons can't just go anywhere. Some signals to stimulate growth, um, kind of going along with, you know, with the decreasing inflammation is preventing death, and then that inhibitory environment. So again, there's not one factor that we're looking to do. We need to do all of these things because all of them can be a limiting effect if you, if you don't, aren't able to accommodate some of them. So our approach is uh, based off of this, and so I, for this is generation one and generation two bridge. And if I take you back to the previous slide, where there's this, you can see how there are bundles of axons going through here. We simply tried to think about how can we create a structure such as this um, for our implant, and we end up coming up with something like this. I will go through why this has seven channels and this has approximately 22 channels shortly. But the idea was that um, we wanted uh, a structure that had essentially a continuous path from one end to the other. So we actually created channels through the material. Um, but at the same time, the rest of this is very highly porous. So the idea is that when you implant this material, um, cells from the host tissue can actually rapidly infiltrate into it. And uh, the effect of that, I, I think, is that's a very key aspect to the design because that rapid cell infiltration um, leads to an integration of the implant with the host. I think it provides mechanical stability. And I also think it helps with uh, um, decreasing inflammation as well and seems to prevent essentially the development of the glial scar, at least to the same extent as you could see without it. But I will show you that. Um, aspect as we go forward. So um, again, rather there are channels as well as a very porous material. And the way that we'd used it is illustrated here in that we would actually have a section of the spinal cord that we would cut out. We would do a lateral hemisection and then essentially we had designed the dimensions of the bridge to actually fit right into the gap that we would have created. And so we could do this implant. 
I'm going to, uh, over time, as we've been making these things, we originally had started with a wrap model. And so I'm going to take you kind of through the progression of things that we've learned. And then as we have done things with a rat, we eventually move to a mouse. And I'll tell you why we had done that as we come along. But uh, really, I think that there's just a number of questions that people have brought up over the years that uh, I think that I would just put out there in front is like, um, peripheral nerve grass has a single lumen. Why would we necessarily want you know, seven or 20 in there? What can that really do? So why multiple channels instead of one? Um, so we're looking to have a, essentially mimicking the architecture, substate for cell growth. We want to do drug delivery. The peripheral nerve graft obviously has an architecture, but also has Schwann cells and other components that are secreting factors that can promote regeneration. And then you know we have this opportunity that not every channel has to be identical. And there essentially is the idea that you know there are sensory tracts and motor tracts located in different places, and different channels could actually be tailored for specific tracts um, in terms of that. And so there is essentially an opportunity to, um, to have that complexity. If you have, if you have a single channel, you can't really do as much with that. If you have multiple channels, well, you can start thinking, well, each channel could potentially be loaded with a different factor. And so again, just kind of architecture where we would essentially be implanting this um, in, in that sort of sense in a, as a lateral hemisection. So the cartoon, just to kind of give you a sense of what's happening, essentially the bridge can be implanted. Um, there is essentially the um, blood infiltration. We're still, blood, uh, star, we're still compromising the blood-brain barrier. But essentially, we're going to be getting cell infiltration from essentially the ends of the bridge, as well as from essentially the center line, central line as well. And um, it's going to bring in macrophages, neutrophils, monocytes, um, as well as the Schwann cells and other components that uh, are, are going to be present. So first off, just to give you a sense of how we are making these, uh, we started off with uh, the approach um, shown here, where we had uh, essentially a mold. Here's as a curved surface that represents the outer edge of the spinal cord. And we had essentially a, a plastic sleeve that was here that we could push pins through. And the pins would align with channels on the other side. And then essentially, we could pour a mixture of polymer and salt around these pins. And essentially, would fill in all the gaps. And then we would use a high pressure carbon dioxide to actually fuse the polymer together into an interconnected structure. And then you take it out, sorry, after you fuse everything together, you pull the pins out to create the channels. And then you take this, you dunk it in water, the salt dissolves out. And so you end up with um, channels as well as a porosity due to the salt that's been leached out. So it's a relatively straightforward process. And if you have 250 micron pins, um, we were able to stack them in to form seven channels. If you go smaller to 150 micron pins, you can actually get a, a higher number there. And um, it was uh, an approach that uh, we started off making them this way. And we're able to go into uh, a rat model. That's where we had started off with. And just to kind of show you what I mentioned before in terms of you implant a bridge, um, as shown here in the outer dashed lines, is that um, these things are very well integrated, essentially, as well as completely filled up with cells at you know, here two weeks and six weeks. And then you can see, um, obviously, we are looking for the cross sections. And we can occasionally get a section where you can actually see a channel um, that's uh, present in the, in the image there. But this uh, tissue apposition was really one of the key points that we were looking for early on is we need to have it and not have a gap between the implant and the host tissue. Otherwise, that's essentially going to be a, a site where a scar could form and axons wouldn't be able to cross. But now you actually have a continuous path. Um, very interestingly, within the channels of the bridge, we actually would see that those cells would seem to be aligned with the axis of the channel as well. And so this happened if the channels were 250 microns or 150 microns. I, I would say that um, the net result of the things that we're seeing is that the 250 micron channels, 150 micron channels didn't seem to make a huge difference in terms of what was happening. Um, and the 250 were a little bit easier to make, and so we kind of went with that um, in that direction. Yes. So the position is very right up against So in this case, you do not get a little glass to come in and collagen all around this. Um, I'll show you a couple images um, very soon, but 
Right, we do not see a significant glial scar um, developing. Um, definitely there are fibroblasts. This RPH is essentially those, for us the best available stain for fibroblasts. And so we are seeing um, cell types resembling fibroblasts throughout the material, particularly within the channels. Um, here the staining is indicate, well, there are some macrophages in the channels, but the macrophages, for example, tend to be within the pores of the bridge. So there is a foreign body response, but I think the major difference we're seeing is the astrocytes aren't really lining up on the outside and depositing lots of uh, con conjoint sulfate in, in this case. But uh, another thing, obviously, over the years, You've heard of the relationship between vascular outgrowth and nerve outgrowth, and this is just simply a, a stain um, for endothelial cells within the channels, indicating that we actually have um, endothelial cells that are growing, um, uh, what are appearing to form, be forming vessels growing through the channels as well too. So we hope that that's something that is maybe contributing to the growth of axons in the channels. Um, in terms of the bridge, we look directly um, adjacent to the bridge. Um, and you say without essentially the mock surgery versus the bridge, uh, I believe this is a, a two-week time point. Um, you know, qualitatively, you see here that there seems to be more staining in this case as opposed to you know, the case where there is a bridge. So uh, relative to um, the absence of a bridge, the presence of a bridge does seem to um, have an effect in terms of decreasing looking at this in sort of greater detail and doing a more specific stain and now also looking at, um, uh, instead of a cross section of it, looking at a longitudinal section of the, of the spinal cord. You can see at one week you see uh, the presence of uh, conjoint sulfate or, um, um, deposition. And then as you look over time, one week, two weeks, six weeks, nine weeks, you kind of see this decline in the area over which you see positive staining for this. So. Um, we don't get rid of a scar by any stretch, but at the same time, there is a significantly diminished um, presence of the scar with this material around. Um, and as you can see here, it's sort of quantified um, on this curve. The other aspect of the response is the macrophages that are coming in. What are they doing there? Um, you know, the, the literature would seem to suggest you need these cells to come in that they're doing some very positive things, but at the same time, you want them from also contributing significantly to the, to the injury. So the idea is that early stages, they're coming in as an M1, but you're literally looking them to translate into more of a repair sort of phenotype to help clear up the debris rather than contributing to more inflammation within the tissue. And one of the uh, things that my collaborator had worked on, so Eileen Anderson had essentially created this graph in her lab for a contusion injury and which she had shown here in terms of the, the blue curve is that uh, macrophages were, were coming in and then starting to go away. And then at the, the two week time point, um, from there on you actually saw a second burst come in in this conclusion model where you know, the initial information followed the second burst. And uh, that's something that we were looking at in our model to see, okay, what's happening with the macrophage numbers and so if we look at here we look at you know, just immune cells and percent of CD45. We see that there's just a continuous decline in the number of macrophages that we're seeing um, in the scaffold over time. And so again, there's just some consistency here of the glial scars going down, um, the macrophages, there isn't the second burst of macrophages coming in. We think that this bridge is really contributing to helping to reduce the sort of um, inflammatory response that's present at the injury. So, while it's hopefully thus far we've talked about some sort of inflammation, now the key thing is, well, how about actually getting axons to survive, grow, or axons to grow, then neurons to survive. And so I always like to just kind of start with this picture where we were fortunate to get a good section where you actually can see an axon bundle that actually seems to have traverses the length of the bridge down a channel. Um, and then there's another one, sort of one here as well too that you can, can see. And so it really was, encouraging to us to be able to see sections like this and see the presence of axons that have truly are, are spanning. When we look at the numbers of axons over time, um, we had done a study that was published earlier this year that went from uh, one week out to six months. And the six month time point is something that's rather unusual. People tend not to go out for, for that long of time, but I'm, I'm well, I was difficult to convincing the student that we should go out that long a time. I think it was very worthwhile, particularly because the six month time point, the bridge is really gone by that time point. 
And so really it's what's left there um, is really just the, the host tissue. And so basically you can see here um, rostral, middle, caudal of the bridge. And so one week, really not a lot of axons any place. At two weeks, you start to see axons. And essentially, the numbers begin to sort of increase um, over time, where you can see an increasing number of bundles. Well, we're trying, we essentially picked out regions that we tried to show were a, you know, a channel or better parts of a channel that were growing in there. And the, the numbers that you can see here are illustrated through uh, one week through um, six months in time in terms of the number of axons at the rostral, middle, and caudal sections of the bridge. And so it was encouraging to see that the rostral region, for example, increased um, over time, but it certainly seemed to plateau after about six to nine weeks in time time. But the caudal region seemed to just be continually increasing over time, as did uh, essentially the middle region. And it was particularly uh, interesting for us at the six-month time point, because we go in, and I will say that the uh, spinal cord did not have its normal thickness in terms of cross-section, so it had sort of contracted and wasn't as thin. But when we sectioned it, this sort of bundle of axons that you can see here, you would see there were seven channels. We would often see five or six bundles of like axons with spaces between them. And so essentially those channels that we originally had set up had left to essentially a, um, a regular array of axons that were there um, at the six-month time point. So that was, the, I think, the, the big excitement um, for Hannah uh, at, at the time. So all these axons have nine and eight? Yes, I'm, I'm coming to that. Um, okay. But yeah, um, we're, again, working through the, the progression of things in terms of, of what's going on. The, uh, we wanted to do some studies in terms of, well, what are the axons that are in there? Certainly, I just showed you some data that they're coming from rostral, coming from caudal, maybe more coming from caudal. And so essentially looking at you know, the um, different staining for descending and ascending fibers. And we're seeing both types of fibers um, within the bridge. And so that's uh, obviously a positive sign. And this is a, a point where we started looking at ways of making the bridges in different ways. Because we thought, OK, if there are seven channels has axons in there, boy, wouldn't 20 channels do better in terms of getting more axons in there? Um, that's a, a really, really simple and straightforward way of doing it. And, or thinking about it, and that's true. The other thing is that we really wanted to get into mouse models uh, to really access the transgenics that are available in terms of being able to look at regeneration. Um, the staining techniques and my collaborators, who I'd mentioned run the, the Christopher Reeve uh, core facility, uh, we tried to do all sorts of tracing. And the presence of the bridge just always seemed to mess up the ability to do tracing to really figure how things worked. And so uh, we just were unsuccessful with all the controls and everything else in place that we really could say something definitively. So um, by accessing the transgenic models, we've had some results that I find very exciting to, to share with you. But let me tell you how we got there. So before, I had mentioned that we had this mold. And we could keep using uh, this, the same mold. But instead of uh, having a guide for the pins to slide through, we did something relatively simple, is essentially we made sugar strands. And essentially, we take the sugar strands, and they're somewhat tacky and sticky. And we could just um, essentially roll them in polymer. And the polymer would stick to it. And polymer and salt would stick to it. So we could then just take the sugar strands, and you could lay them in here. And essentially, they would pack more tightly together than we could actually pack the pins. We couldn't really make the pins closer together, um, because when we were pulling the pins out, if they were packed too tightly, they would actually break the polymer walls between the pins. And so we had a constraint there. And so we couldn't make more slippery pins. So we ended up making pins that could actually dissolve. And therefore, you didn't have to actually pull them out. And so this allowed us to go from you know, before we had a wrap bridge that had seven channels. And now they have approximately 22 channels. And at the same time, we can now make a mouse bridge, because they pack together as well, that has seven channels. And this is something that essentially um, uh, was something that the manual technique, we just couldn't make anything that small. I think if we were to try to do this with our previous technique, we probably could get a single channel in there. And that's not what we were, not what we were looking for. <clears throat> so in terms of this, we look at the number of um, axons and the rat and the mouse. And you can see that, um, you see if we have a scaffold, I'll, I'll go to the two-week and the 
eight week time point, we see two weeks and eight weeks, two weeks and eight weeks. If we definitely see the increase in terms of the number of axons, we're able to do this in a mouse model. And uh, we had also done the studies with how much salt is there. And uh, if you had uh, essentially a low amount of salt, such that really no salt, that this porosity is coming primarily from the channels, then you can gradually add salt to it. You can increase the overall porosity. And as you increase the porosity of the scaffold, particularly at, at the eight-week time point, you see an increase in the number of axons that are growing there. And this, for us, is just an indication that the cells that are infiltrating to the scaffold, they are conditioning the environment to allow for cells to actually, um, for the axons to extend through that environment. And so it's a combination of their being there and also not contributing to a scar that we believe is really a lie. It's allowing these axons to actually regrow. But uh, now with um, the mouse model, we uh, are able to access these transgenic models. Uh, and so this is something that my uh, collaborator at UC Irvine had done. And essentially, we used the, the CRIM mouse. Um, and essentially, CRIM is a transcription factor expressed at high levels in neuron layers. And uh, basically, uh, the gist of it is that, say, the CRIM GFP mice exhibit robust labeling of the cortical spinal tract. And so um, they, uh, uh, so I think the, the next image is probably the one that I really like to show because this is the idea of that here you can see the cortical spinal tract, but this then was done with um, essentially a, an injury and a bridge implanted. And you can see here's the cortical spinal tract at an early time point, And then you don't really see anything in the caudal regions. And essentially through the bridge, essentially this, this tract is just is disrupted. And so uh, the GFP labeling of this is, is absent um, in the caudal region. So we started looking for this at later time points. And so we're now at a 10-week uh, a time point. And essentially, you can follow the series of images. Here's kind of the big picture. And then panel B is at the rostral region. C is in the middle. D is in the caudal region. And then E essentially is, uh, sorry, D is the caudal interface. And E is um, exiting the bridge or uh, caudal to the injury. And essentially, we can see lots of GFP labeling um, in all sections in terms of entering the bridge, um, in the middle of the bridge, um, at the exit of the bridge, and even in downstream. And so, we were um, very encouraged um, by this. Uh, and I will say that my collaborator is also very rigorous in terms of what she's doing and um, brought up the very good point of saying, well, how do you know that this GFP labeling you're seeing isn't just macrophages that are picking up debris? And how do you know it's truly an axon? And so that's where we had done these studies where essentially you have the CRIM GFP and then looking for co-labeling of, of the neurofilament at the same time. And so I think I'll just focus sort of in G, the region G here, which is actually just at the uh, caudal interface of the bridge. And then in panels I and J, which are subsections of G, essentially these two here, you can see that this co-labeling of the green and the red, the showing yellow, are indicated by these arrows, that we are definitely seeing this co-labeling that's happening in there, indicating that we actually have um, GFP labeled axons that essentially have crossed and exited the bridge. And we can actually see um, labeling such as this up to a couple millimeters caudal to the injury as well. So um, again, at the 10-week time point, we see these things that are able to enter, cross, and, and exit. And I think that uh, you know, I've definitely seen a, a number of papers in the literature that show the cortical spinal tract coming right up to the injury and just stopping. And I think um, my collaborators and I are just very excited to see that we have not, done nothing more here than put in a structure, an architecture that allows for cell recruitment, minimize an inflammatory response, and that is really allowing this tract to actually regrow through the injury site. And I think that um, that component of the, of the result, I think, is what's been very exciting. Um, this is the uh, functional recovery, the only functional recovery data that I'm going to uh, really show you. And that uh, you can see the control animals are in white, the ones with the bridge, that uh, we did a, a ladder beam test. And you can see at the two-week time point, the animals with the bridge actually had made more errors. But by the time you reach the 10-week time point, the animals um, that had gotten a bridge actually are making fewer errors. In terms of so, uh, I don't know that this behavior um, 
behavioral improvement is a direct result of axons growing through the injury site, but I um, do suspect that you know, it is contributing to the plasticity and the rewiring that's allowing this to happen. Um, and so we're continuing to look into this and tr follow up on this so that we can really see um, what the benefits are and what we can do next. So now, while uh, I had mentioned early on that the idea that no one factor is gonna be the magical solution to this, I think hopefully at the, this point I've shown you that just having a structure that uh, provides some mechanical stability, allows for cell and growth, kind of uh, provides some directional support for axons to grow, maybe helps to re uh, reduce an immune or inflammatory response, that it's doing a lot of beneficial things, but we've never, we never thought that that in and of itself was gonna be sufficient. And so we really looked at to try to say, can we do drug delivery into this environment as well? And so there are lots of strategies out there that are kind of listed across the bottom. You can do a direct injection, you can do osmotic pumps, people transplanted genetically engineered cells to secrete factors. And um, while there are lots of uh, studies in this area, they were sort of unsatisfying to us. You know, the osmotic pump, for example, has the port. That port can actually damage the spinal cord sometimes, or it can get clogged, and so it could be inconsistent. If you transplant engineered cells, you, the cell survival early on is you know, very high, but then it very falls off very quickly, and so you're not really clear as to, well, how much factor is actually being produced over time. Um, the injection is very short-lived. And so we've really looked into can we deliver protein, plasmid, or viruses um, from the bridges as a way to actually do this. Um, so we started with protein, and the bridges that we made and the way we were making them, we could get protein release from the bridges for a period of a few weeks. Uh, at the same time, that process of putting the protein in also made some, uh, compromise the integrity to some extent. And so we really weren't satisfied um, with those studies. And so we uh, worked initially with doing non-viral gene delivery from this, delivering plasmid. And we could get expression. We had a few papers on this of really showing that we could get expression um, that would persist. But the levels weren't terribly high in, in terms of how we were doing it. And so that led us to actually moving to the area of actually delivering viruses from the bridge. And that is something that has been the, the, the work that I'll talk to you about um, in terms of going forward. And so the, the, really the idea is that we want to essentially um, take these materials and be able to locally deliver these viral vectors from them. And the idea is that we don't have a specific targeting cell type in mind. The whole idea is that the viruses are gonna be released locally, cells are gonna be growing into this bridge, the cells are gonna be able to take up those things, and those cells that are gonna become the bioreactors for the localized production of hopefully inductive factors. And uh, the idea in particular that I'm, I, I'm not saying that this is the final translational approach down the road, but I think the advantages here are the things that I'm excited about because with the, um, the lentiviral vectors that we're using, you really can get long-term expression in this, so therefore you can make things available. Um, it's very versatile that we can look at, um, if we want to deliver NT3 in one experiment and then we want to do BDNF in another experiment, we just swap out the viral vector and use the exact same delivery system. If we were delivering them as proteins, if we did NT3 and we got that to work, if we then want to do BDNF, well, we need to reevaluate the entire delivery system all over again. And so the versatility of it just allows you to kind of screen through factors a lot more easily, as well as to be able to consider can we do multiple factors at the same time and be able to really combine them. The fact that all the viral vectors have the same physical properties, where each protein has a very different physical property, allows you to actually look at, uh, take advantage of these hopefully. So we, uh, I, I had this kind of give you a sense of um, our, our ideas. So this uh, sort of cartoon is really geared towards work that we had done over approximately 10 years of time in terms of kind of building the idea and that what we've tried to do is actually build an interaction between the vector and the material. And the whole thing with this as this animation will show is that cells are coming in, the virus is um, being retained in there for a period of time and then can be released. If the virus comes out too quickly, it almost escapes and gets diluted out before the cells get in. If this, and so there's this balance that we're looking for. And at the same time, if the material holds on to the virus too tightly, well then the cells can't internalize it and then um, become transduced. And so therefore, there is sort of this happy medium that we're looking for, that Goldilocks spot, in order to try to uh, 
find uh, the right delivery system. And so some initial studies that we had done were taking uh, nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite. Uh, they uh, were something that essentially bound the virus and actually stabilized it, uh, gave it a much longer half-life. And we could actually just load that. You know, These nanoparticles were uh, around in the range of 80 to 100 nanometers. We could actually just load them within the pores of the bridge. And they would hold the virus and keep it from escaping. And we could actually get uh, uh, profiles that look like this. And so essentially, this is absolute levels of luciferase activity reflected as a distance from the implant site. So this is the implant site. And you would see that at uh, one week, we would see um, high levels of compression. And then you would see this natural gradient that would form. And I think we were actually very encouraged by the presence of this gradient, that you have the expression that's highest. Um, at the center, we'd, hopefully this would be a directional signal that would really could be used potentially to actually encourage cell and growth towards the implant or towards the injury. At the same time, it's not so high because I think that's been one of the knocks about um, essentially drug delivery locally is that if the axons grow into it and this is such a favorable environment, they'll never want to leave. And so the idea that it would be high initially and then go down over time at least seems to be the right model. Whether we've not got the exact kinetics that we want, I'm not sure. But uh, these trends are things that we think are um, provocative and um, potentially could be useful in, the, in this context. The cell types that are being transduced uh, depend upon where you are. So if you're directly in the bridge, we see you know, fibroblasts, macrophages, Schwann cells um, being traduced, transduced. If we look adjacent to the tissue, we see uh, more astrocytes, but you also see the Schwann cells, macrophages, and fibroblasts being transduced as well. Um, and this is at a, a day seven time point. And now while the hydroxyapatite was a, a, an approach that did work for us, um, some of the initial studies that we had done had really um, had, had shown axon growth, but at the same time, there was the hydroxyapatite also seemed to do something in terms of mineralization within the tissue, which we didn't want. So we began looking for other approaches for actually modifying the surface. And so we used this combination of heparin and chitosan uh, as a way of uh, creating a surface that would actually bind the viruses as well. And so this is uh, an approach that you could see here that we could uh, incorporate um, combinations of things this way. The hyaluronin really didn't do much. The chitosan, like this is uh, loadings that we were able to get on there with these different chemistries. Um, but really, this is the technique that we had focused on in the middle that was this combination of chitosan and the hyaluronin. And you can see here that in terms of the virus, the retention of the virus, that uh, if we have a heparin coating, that the virus was retained very readily. If it was just chitosan, the virus essentially was released um, from the material. And essentially, the amount of expression um, that was done in vitro at this, at this study showed that it could actually be retained um, pretty significantly. When we went in vivo, we used an in vivo imaging system deliver, expressing luciferase. And you can see here that uh, the expression profiles um, an increase, you know, a slight dip uh, at the day 24, but essentially other times uh, are essentially achieving high levels that are sustained for, you know, in this case, um, almost nine weeks. And so uh, in the end, it's really very much localized over the implantation site. So this, uh, these are essentially the tool. It's hard to get this sort of consistent um, expression if you're doing protein delivery. But with the virus, essentially, we're getting essentially relatively consistent levels um, over time. The effect of it, uh, this was done in, in the rat model, which was uh, certainly very exciting. One week, nothing happening. Two weeks, I had shown you some images with empty bridges before. I think these are very consistent with that. But now if you express BDNF or NT3, certainly by the time you reach two week, four weeks for both of these, obviously a dramatic increase in the number of um, the staining that we see for axons at that time point. So we were obviously very encouraged in terms of that. Um, by delivering the uh, NT3 and BDNF, we have the numbers here at the rostral, middle, and caudal regions. And you can see NT3 and BDNF dramatically increase the number of axons in the uh, rostral region of the bridge. Um, and the middle and the caudal regions, it really doesn't have a very um, significant effect in terms of that. So we seem to be having the expression of these factors having a more, uh, a much more dramatic effect uh, on the descending axons that you would see at the rostral region. 
Uh, we've also had done chondritinase as a way of saying the scar that does form, what is happening, and so chondritinase um, in the uninjured cord versus with chondritinase expression, you can see that we're actually able to much more significantly reduce the, the staining for these uh, chondritin sulfate proteoglycans. Um, we're also looking to use gene delivery as a way of um, modulating the immune response, you know, particularly inflammatory response in the macrophages. So I mentioned that that big peak that w that was up here before in terms of the contusion model, and we said, well, what can we do with IL-10 uh, as a way of actually trying to force the cells, these macrophages, towards more of an M2 sort of phenotype, and uh, in particular, um, what you can see here is we would seed cells, we would push them towards an M1, and then we would add on one of the treatment conditions and then collect and measure TNF levels. And so if you push them to M1 and you add the M1 factors, you can see a very robust TNF response. If you just add IL-10 protein, you can have a pretty modest effect. If you, so if you add IL-10 protein at this point, you have, can you know, a modest effect in terms of doing this. But if you do the IL-10 as a viral vector and actually get sustained exposure, sustained production over time, you can actually have a much more robust effect in terms of reducing uh, TNF production, for example, by the macrophages. And that's even uh, shown here again. And the whole point is that what I'm trying to make here is relative between protein delivery and viral delivery, that the viral delivery, which provides you the sustained um, expression, the sustained production, is actually more effective at actually reducing um, the uh, you know, TNF levels or promoting IL-10 production um, itself as a way of actually trying to sustain that effect. And so that's, I think, an opportunity for the viruses as well. And then you can see uh, another way this is envisioned is looking at the activity of the nf kappa B transcription factor, and that if you just have the protein um, and you uh, expose them to an essentially M1 cytokines, the, M the uh, nf kappa B has a very robust response to the M1 cytokines when there's just IL-10 protein. But if you have the IL-10 virus, the nf kappa B transcription factor doesn't get as robustly activated in the presence of M1 cytokines. So the idea of, uh, in this case, we're able to initially push them more towards uh, an M2 phenotype, and we're able to actually keep them in the M2 a bit better as a consequence of using the virus to have a sustained production. So how this pans out in terms of uh, the studies, um, basically at day seven by expressing a virus versus a uh, control virus versus an IL-10, we see a reduction in the number of the GR1 positive uh, neutrophils coming into the scaffold. At day seven, at day 28, we see this reduction of the GR1 as well as uh, a trend towards a decrease in the number of uh, dendritic cells. The macrophages, you know, that who are still working and analyzing these studies, the IL-10, you wouldn't really expect it to reduce cell infiltration significantly, but the hope is that these F480 macrophages are actually going to have a greater staining for M2 markers. Um, and so we're in the process of, of doing that currently. And so uh, taking this further, we've looked at um, how much virus can we put on, and as we put more virus on, we actually can get higher expression levels, but you can see here that it is the opportunity to actually put multiple viruses onto the bridge that will allow us to actually uh, get expression. And what we have uh, begun looking towards is this idea of can, you know, I've talked about neurotrophic factors, we've talked about, you know, anti-inflammatory factors. Now I'm going to talk to you about factors that are really geared towards trying to recruit progenitor cells and if we push them to an oligodendrocyte lineage so that we can hopefully enhance myelination of these regenerating axons that I've shown you that are in the bridge. And so this is a, arguably a simplified diagram of this, of the neural stem cells that are SOX2 positive that can become oleg2 positive and go towards an oligodendrocyte or they can actually go towards astrocyte. Um, they do have the potential to go towards neurons, though this path does not happen very often in vivo, um, to my understanding. And so what we had looked at is actually delivering sonic hedgehog as a way of actually getting more oligodendrocytes in this and, and fewer astrocytes. So that was our, our strategy in terms of doing this. When we um, do this, I will say we looked at the SOX2 positive cells and the density. Here you can see um, uh, the firefly luciferase, a sonic hedgehog, an NT3, and then an NT3 and an SHH. Um, and so from these studies, we quantified it, and you could say, okay, in the firefly luciferase condition, there's a, a 
180 or so uh, per millimeter squared of saxifacil, but the presence of Sonic Hedgehog reduces the density, and then the NT3 and SHH combination um, seem to not have as significant of a reduction in that cell type. So essentially, this is suggesting that we're seeing fewer of these progenitor cells when we're delivering these factors that are present at that site. <clears throat> While there's fewer progenitor cells, in the case of GFAP, which is standing for the astrocytes, we see when there's NT3 present, we actually see an increase relative to the control in terms of astrocyte markers being stained. But the sonic hedgehog condition does not increase this um, significantly. And now when we look at staining for oligodendrocytes, we can see by um, relative to control that the sonic hedgehog actually increases the number of oligomarkers um, significantly increases the staining for oligodendrocytes um, within the tissue. Um, there is also an increase, obviously, with NT3 and SHH as well. But the key thing is if you look at this ratio of oligodendrocytes to astrocytes, we're seeing significantly more oligodendrocytes um, in that ratio without necessarily getting more astrocytes coming through. But the key thing is so we are arguably getting more oligos in a couple of these conditions. But does that really translate to more myelination of axons um, is really the question. So, but, um, so again, the, the images we go through and we quantify. And in particular, we're looking at uh, staining of MBP staining with this, and particularly looking at um, uh, so the co-localization of um, MBP with essentially the neurofilament. And you can see in all these conditions where we deliver the, the trophic factors, we see an increase in the amount of, of myelination. But this doesn't distinguish whether it's myelination by Schwann cells or myelination by oligodendrocytes. And so we've followed up by doing an MBP P0 staining, um, where P0 is a marker for Schwann cell myelin. So for myelination by oligodendrocytes, you're looking for MBP positive, P0 negative stains. And when we look at that, we can see that uh, the sonic hedgehog condition is the only one that really has a substantial increase. And of the myelinated axons now, um, approximately 75% of them are myelinated by oligodendrocytes, um, according to this. So I think it is a, uh, a step in the right direction of you know, enhancing myelination in general, but also enhancing myelination by oligodendrocytes at the same time. So that's, uh, that's where we stand. We've, um, we still have to put all the pieces together to actually be able to test the, the most effective strategies. And then actually, as we're going forward, really looking to bring in the stem cell components, I think that we perceive our ability to recruit endogenous progenitor cells um, that is appealing. It's having some beneficial effects in terms of, of myelinating of axons. But there are still, uh, not all the axons are myelinated still. And so I think uh, the numbers seem to suggest that 60% you know, of the axons still are not myelinated. And that's where we think we need to really deliver more of these um, exogenous cells to really supplement that as well. But we're continuing to look at uh, some strategies in that area. Um, but this has been a, a platform that allows us to do uh, many things in terms of controlling the local environment, controlling inflammation, stabilizing the injury. And uh, the other part that I'm particularly interested in is a platform for looking at combinations of factors. The, the anti-inflammatories combined with the sonic hedgehog combined with neurotrophins. And how can we get synergy between these factors and uh, potentially through you know, the developments that are happening in terms of the viral vector design, can we have certain factors that aren't expressed for several weeks and then turn on at the right time or have something that's turned on early on and then be, get shut off at a later time? We're looking to try to bring in factors such as that uh, to really, really be able to more finely tune um, the factors. So the last part is for Jeff. So hopefully you all will uh, appreciate this. But it's a, uh, a, a new strategy that uh, we've been working on, really dealing with uh, neural inflammation. And so it's is, uh, my collaborator, Steve Miller, that's working on. And so I presented a little bit of our work of the you know, uh, immune tolerance induction and models of multiple sclerosis. And so um, I'm assuming this audience is probably pretty familiar with uh, multiple sclerosis models. But the idea that um, you know, the, there is idea or times where people essentially get sick and then have periods where they're doing better, then get sick again. And our mouse model recapitulates that. And in particular, essentially, the antigens are known that are essentially responsible for this peak disease. And so this is uh, an instance where, essentially, you immunize the mice 
they mount an immune response towards the, um, the antigens in, in indicated here, and then they will go in and actually um, start you know, demyelinating axons, leading to essentially these uh, phenotypic responses that you can see here. And we have uh, uh, designed particles which we actually can take the antigens and put the antigens on those particles and deliver them. And those antigens can actually tolerate the animal. Um, so the particles will tolerate the animal to those antigens. So normally you would initiate disease by um, delivering antigens on um, with an adjuvant to essentially induce disease, and then we can either deliver the particles um, seven days beforehand in essentially a preventive tolerance approach, or we can deliver them 14 days later or two days later in more of a, a kind of a therapeutic approach as a way of actually trying to suppress the immune response uh, to those antigens. And so uh, I presented a lot of data on that yesterday, um, but one that I didn't present that I'll just will kind of summarize a lot is like if we put the antigens onto particles, we can actually tolerate the response. And this just indicates that we've done this with liposomes. We've done this with PLG particles that were um, made with this uh, surfactant PVA. Um, we've done it with uh, polystyrene particles. Um, this has been used by my collaborator uh, originally to do splenocytes. And so liposomes work incredibly well at essentially maintaining a, a near zero clinical score. These particles do not work nearly as well. The splenocytes um, have some effect of attenuating disease. Polystyrene particles work pretty well. But none of them worked nearly as well as these PLG particles that we had made with this uh, surfactant PEMA that puts a carboxylic acid coating on the outside of the particles. And essentially, these are actually were uh, our most effective uh, strategy in terms of actually uh, essentially maintaining a zero clinical score for, for these animals. And it's striking is that you can, we've taken this curve out to uh, 250 days, and the animals still never get sick. And so it's really uh, remarkable uh, to us that we're able to have a, such a very specific effect in terms of attenuating the immune response. But the part that, uh, so this, uh, a new audience, I hadn't shown this yesterday, but the idea is, so what's happening in terms of these particles is that we are coupling antigens to these particles. The particles are injected intravenously. They're being taken up by antigen-presenting cells, and those antigen-presenting cells are actually able, able to induce energy in activated T cells. They're inducing energy in naive T cells, and they're actually inducing the production of regulatory T cells. So essentially, in terms of the uh, immune response, the antigen essentially is getting presented that can act on effector T cells, act on naive T cells to either get energy in this case or actually induce the production of regulatory T cells. And so that was um, something that uh, was of interest. But the, the part that I specifically was talking with Jeff about yesterday is we had a control study that we had done in the animals at one point where essentially you immunize the animal and they start, uh, you'd expect them to start getting sick around day 10. But uh, instead, what we had done at day nine, we actually started giving them daily injections of particles. And the whole idea is as you gave them daily injections of particles, that these animals did not develop disease in a very significant way. Where these animals essentially didn't get particles, obviously had that, you know, were getting sick and that getting the relapsing, remitting aspect of the disease. These animals really didn't develop disease to the same extent. And then we injected particles for about, um, you know, eight days. And then after we stopped the particles, there was essentially a lag period. And then you saw the animals starting to get sick again. And so there, the whole thinking behind this is that we're really just distracting the immune system from this response. And so there is normally an inflammatory response that's happening. And the delivery of particles is actually um, um, affecting that. And so the whole idea here, as you can see here, is now instead of uh, particles being delivered at the onset of disease, you wait to essentially day um, 20, approximately. And then you start injecting particles. And the animals essentially show a significant improvement in disease score until you stop delivering particles. And then they actually begin to get sick again. So um, in both a um, similar to the prevention model as well as the therapeutic model, you can see these particles were having a dramatic effect in terms of the clinical score. And what uh, my collaborators had 
taken this observation and done a lot more with it. They looked at uh, ischemic reperfusion injury. They looked at a peritoneal thioglycolate infl inflammation model. Um, they looked at a, a model of stroke. And uh, they had shown a, a similar sort of phenotypic response by the injection of naked particles that I think was you know, very surprising to me. And in terms of mechanism of what's going on, they went through and they said, well, well, what's happening? And so the first thing is they went into the CNS and did flow looking at CD45 positive cells. And you can see that the, in the vehicle control versus the one that got particles, essentially there is a cell population that you're not seeing in the spinal cord, that the CD45, CD11B positive cells aren't showing up. And then furthermore, looking at you know, the vehicle versus this, you can see um, essentially uh, a lack of cells that are essentially positive for the Lysic-C, CD11C um, staining. And so, again, this is the idea that instead of mobilizing cells from the periphery to go to the sites of inflammation, this essentially seems to be preventing those cells from going there. How is it doing it? Um, well, it, I won't say that we know exactly for sure, but certainly the one thing that was interesting is we went into the spleen and did flow cytometry on that, looking for Lysic-C cells. And in the vehicle control, you see relatively few Lysic-C cells, but when we're delivering particles, we see essentially a significant number of Lysic positive cells within the spleen. And so one, one of the components of this seems to be that these um, barely circulating monocytes are taking up the particles and are essentially becoming sequestered in the spleen, arguably distracted from going to the sites of inflammation. And so you can see in the spinal cord, there's a dramatic reduction in uh, leukocytes as well as uh, um, DCs, and then at the same time, the uh, spleen, you see this dramatic increase in the Lysic-C um, positive cells uh, with, uh, with the delivery of particles. So uh, it's an intriguing result that uh, we're continuing to look into, but the thought it would have, in particular our conversation with Jeff, was the idea of inflammatory responses that are happening in the CNS. Is this something that potentially could be useful in that context? And um, I'd say I'm, I'm not definitive in that, but I think it's some interesting results in terms of where we're going. So with that, um, I've ex overextended my time. I try to stay on schedule for, for everybody, but uh, I will stop there and uh, um, acknowledge this great team of people that have been working in the spinal cord for a number of years for us, it's a project that goes back about 10 years now. And uh, I'll thank you for attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. So we have not done anything with peripheral nerve. Um, and in part, the tubes in peripheral nerve regeneration seem to work pretty well. And so I think that was when we were getting started, I was asking around and talking to neurosurgeons and um, plastic surgeons. And uh, it just seemed that these, the problems with the spinal cord were something that was going to be a greater challenge. And so that's the way we had gone. And so we've not really met with someone to work with a peripheral nerve perspective. So um, we haven't done anything in patients. Um, I can tell you the nature of our conversations in terms of discussions, what we're thinking in that. Um, I will say that we, in looking through the literature, there are instances where people are going in and saying, here is this patient that's had an injury established for a period of time, and they're not getting any recovery or function, that there are people that are trying to go in and saying, can we cut out the scar and do things? So. Um, I don't know how viable that is. Obviously, the concern is, are you going to be damaging healthy circuits? And so um, obviously, that's, I think, the, the key question. So, But there is some effort to try to look into whether the feasibility of that is there. I think that uh, at least our collaborators in the way we've been talking about this and uh, going forward is uh, in some cases where there's actually a, um, a penetrating injury that there could actually be some sort of instability that a bridge such as this that could be implanted 
actually might help to stabilize that injury. And, and again, in the case of a penetrating injury, it might be something that could be applied if it was uh, an available off-the-shelf product that you could take something that's the right shape, carve it to fit it, and be able to insert it. And, I, and I, that seems to be a very reasonable strategy. Um, and then the idea of, you know, maybe that could be coded with some sort of virus or drug delivery vehicle, I think that, that um, certainly seems like a very tractable approach. You're right, for a, a standard contusion injury, I don't think that this is something that you would want to do because you don't really know the outcome of that patient and what they're going to be. And so there needs to be time for, for that to happen. But in the context of penetrating injuries, we sort of view this as a, at least a direction we're going long term is, can we put something in immediately that might help to stabilize the cord, prevent a significant um, inflammation going forward, secondary injury? and then potentially come back in at a later time with stem cell injections, rostral and caudal to the implant after the patient has somewhat stabilized over a period of time. And so I think that's the way we're thinking about this going forward, is trying to be able to combine these techniques in that way. Do you know if any of these uh, axons make connections in either direction, ascending or descending? Um, you showed the one yeah. slide with a little bit of functional. Right, and we're just getting geared up for that. So that, that functional test is something that's relatively new data, and it's just something that the, the um, studies with the CRIM, the CST, that was really our first chance to know that these axons were crossing. And so that was, for us, that's like, okay, now it's time to start thinking, looking at synaptic formation, that we actually can see them coming out the other side. So we, we haven't uh, done that yet, and again, it is the, the key thing where we need to go. I was curious that you chose to kind of mimic the, the structure of the peripheral nerve. You based your spinal cord uh, on the sciatic nerve instead of trying to sort of uh, reproduce the structure of the spinal cord itself. Mm -hmm. So could you speculate on that? I mean, you're basing one intervention mm -hmm. on essentially an earlier one. Right. So the, I agree. And so I think the, the, the reason for telling the story in this way, I think, is because the peripheral nerve graft had some demonstrated efficacy in terms of doing this and the idea that you're trying to start from scratch in terms of building things up. In terms of a specific architecture, um, certainly we did something that I think is relatively crude in terms of just we have just random assortments of channels. and. Um, and I, hopefully, we've shown some things that says, oh, you know, channels might actually be very effective in this context. But there could be much more sophisticated approaches, such as doing 3D printing, to get and you know, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be spherical channels, but they could be oblong, that to more match the architecture of the spinal cord. Um, that would have been hard for us to make those things at the early stage, or to invest the time in printing something that complicated when we didn't really know if it worked. So I think our approach was sort of the first step, and let's say if this seems like a reasonable thing to do, I think we are at the point of, okay, it doesn't seem too unreasonable. And now I think we are, one of the considerations is going forward, especially with the transition to Michigan, that they seem to have you know, five or six people that are doing 3D printing to see if we can actually make things. Um, the challenge that we're encountering within 3D printing of these things is the mouse spinal cord is still pretty small. <laughs> And so making channels by 3D printing that are like this is not trivial. How big was the heavy section? Was it over several repeatable levels? Um, in the rat model, it was four millimeters. And as we've gone to the mouse, it's about two and a half millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that when you were mentioning <coughs> and other growth factors, uh -huh. okay, that in the bridge, they have greater concentration the rostral part, okay? Mm -hmm. but, but not in the medium, they call the part. Uh, the axons were greater in the rostral, but not the middle or caudal. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's yeah. why you see, you see more signal for DNA, maybe, yeah? Um, well, the, when we were, just to make sure that I'm, when we restate it and you tell me if I'm on the same page with you, that um, if we uh, deliver BDNF, for example, we can get the highest expression at the implant but it, it falls off both sides. So the, its highest concentration at the implant, um, immediately caudal, it's at a slightly lower concentration, and then it gets lower concentration as you fall off farther. And so it's present sort of across the injury, 
but the response was primarily from the rostral region that had descending axons that would be more responsive to BDNF. And then, therefore, we saw more axons growing at the rostral region, and we didn't really see an, an enhancement in the number of axons in the caudal region. I'm still fixating on uh, <laughs> the lack of fibrous encapsulation response. Because okay. uh, when we do it, we always see it. So okay. I'm asking what I'm trying to know is, is it because of the porosity, perhaps, of the material that you have? Is it the material itself? I think it's I think it's the porosity. I think it's the fact that the cells are able to penetrate in through the space. They have a place to go. They can adhere, rather than if cells are kind of at the periphery. There's really nothing to move into. My, I guess, I, I'll have to say intuition, because I, I don't know that I can point to like the scientific fact, but the fact that they would line up at the at the at the edge of the at the boundary of the injury, and really don't have any place to go, leads to more of a frustrated phenotype that leads to the more deposition and the accumulation. But because they have a place to go, they don't deposit these factors kind of throughout the bridge. And we really don't see a lot of conjoint sulfate staining within the bridge itself. It always is just in that outside region. All right, Jeff, well, I've never given you a chance to ask a question, so. Okay. Um, then, then I'll ask mine um, for the last one. I'm curious if you could comment a little bit on the mechanism for how your implants prevent blood-brain barrier damage compared to maybe the other models where you see a lot of blood-brain barrier damage. Um, I would say that I don't have a good answer of like how it's working in terms of this mechanism because we are very much compromising the blood-brain barrier. And uh, I guess I'm hoping that it's kind of this idea of the, the cells being able to move in. Again, there is obviously a, a, a beneficial component to some extent as long as it doesn't get carried away to leave the secondary injury. And I'm hoping we're just shifting the balance a little bit in terms of what the cells are doing. Thank you.